In the last video, I was just showing you how to use the first derivative in order to check for local max and min. But it turns out you can also use a combination that also includes the second derivative. So just to show you how we can also include that. Now I want to just remind you then what the second derivative does. So maybe I'll say this, I'll remember. You know, uh, what the second derivative does. So remember that you know, y prime primed means concavity. Right, so that means then that if y prime prime is greater than zero, then it's concave up, like this right here. That's going to be important. Because if something is concave up, we can see that something has a minimum. Whereas if something, if the second derivative is negative, then it's like this, it's concave down. So we can use this property uh, in order to check for a maximum or minimum. So again, so here are the sort of two steps to doing it here. So step one, how can we use second derivatives to check for max and min? Well, step one, we still have to do what we did before, which was to find where the first derivative equals zero. So we find where the first derivative is zero. And again, that's because no matter what the equation looks like, that right, could be some weird looking equation like this. We know that, let's say at this point right here, and I guess also here, if I sort of draw it like this right here, and also here, we've got three different places here technically where we have a local min, a local max, and a local min again, which happens to be the global minimum. But all three of these special points, the derivative is zero. That's because again, the tangent would be horizontal here. The slope of the tangent would be zero. Fine, okay. But then what we can do before we were looking at step two was to check that the first derivative changes sign left or right. But actually, I'm going to write this down now. So I'm going to say use f prime prime of x to check concavity. So in other words, here we're just going to use a second derivative. So if, so if f prime prime of x is greater than zero, then it goes like this, you know, that means it opens upwards. That means this right here, that is a minimum. And if f prime prime of x is less than zero, that means it opens downwards. That means this is like this, so that is a max. It's that easy. So rather than doing a sine diagram, we can actually just take a look and see what it is. So maybe we should do an example. So I have one here, so find the x coordinates only. Before in the other example, we'd look at x and y coordinates. Here, I just care about the x. So find the x coordinates of any local max or min points for this function, f of x equals x cubed minus six x squared plus nine x plus three. Well, step one, if we look at this, remember these are the two handy dandy steps to using this method, right? So if we do this right here, Step one, find where the derivative is zero. Well, then let's do that. So step one, let's see, how do we do that? Well, I need f prime of x in this case. It's just a matter of using different notation here, just to get you used to the fact that sometimes we write y, sometimes we say f prime, sometimes we say dy dx, doesn't matter. So in this case right here, f of x is this, so f prime of x will be, well, again, this is an easy derivative to take. So three comes in front, so it becomes three x to the power of three minus one, which is two. And then this next one, minus uh, two in front of the six, two times six is 12 times x to the power of uh, two minus one is one. So, oops, I don't have to write anything then. Then I have plus nine x, derivative of nine x is just nine. And again, that's because it's like a little stealth one here, one comes in front, makes it a nine. Nine times x to the power of one minus one, that's zero, x to the zero is just one. So that's why it's just this, this thing goes poof. That's my derivative. Now the thing is I have to set that equal to zero. So I wanna do zero times all this, and actually wait, uh, before that, I can actually factor this, that's nice. I can take out a common number from all three of these. I can take out a three. So this would be x squared minus, let's see, uh, 12 divided by three is four, and nine divided by three is three. So this is the same. This just makes it a bit easier to look at. 
maybe now I want to actually factor this. If you remember how to factor this, it's like, uh, I want to really, I want to factor this thing. Oops. I'm going to try to factor the following here in case you forgot how to factor. I've got lots of, there's lots of ways of factoring, but I want to try to factor this. I just want to work on this thing right here. Well, this is written in, uh, this is general form for a quadratic. This is like ax squared plus bx plus c. So in this case, a is 1, b is negative 4, and c is 3. And the trick for factoring, at least first, you have to find two numbers whose product, prod, that's what I'm trying to write here, although I'm not writing it clearly. I want two numbers whose product is a times c, so 1 times 3 and whose sum is just b. So that's always a rule, because the product has to be a times c, the sum has to be just b, so in this case, just this. So if I can find two numbers who multiply to 3 and add up to negative 4, then I can factor this. Well, what are the values that multiply uh, to 3? Well, I've got 1 and 3. Well, 1 and then, so that's a product of 3. But do they add up to negative 4? Well, no, they add up to positive 4. But I can also say this. Negative 1 times negative 3 also multiplies to 3, but they add up to negative 4. So I've found the numbers I needed. So the way I like to do factoring now is I do a little trick here. Maybe you've never seen it before. That's okay. Most factoring tricks start with this. But the reason I like this trick is this works for anything, even including if a is not 1. So if a, I don't know, maybe there's like a 7 here. Most factoring tricks are really tough to work with. I like this way here. So I write these. Here's the weird part. I divide them both by a. So in this case right here, a is 1. And negative 3 divided by a, that's just this. I would reduce these fractions if I could, but I can't. Then I would write them then what I call bottom to top. So that means this bottom number becomes times x. So it becomes 1 times x, which is just x. And then I add or subtract this. So in this case, it's 1 times x minus 1. So x minus 1. And this becomes 1 times x minus 3. So x minus 3. Therefore, I have 0 equals 3 times x minus 1 times x minus 3. Now, if you know about factoring, you've done it before, you could have probably just looked at this and then written this. That's great. I'm just trying to show you how I would do it for any factoring thing, even if it's really complicated. I would have done it like this. So this right here, all that just to give me that value right there. Okay, so I have 0 equals 3 times junk times junk. Well, what values of x make this 0? Well, x value of 1, if I make x equal to 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 times 3 times anything, that works. And an x value of, let's see here, if I make it 3. 3 minus 3 gives me 0. 0 times anything will also make it work. So I've got those two x values. I've got x equals 1 and x equals 3. So those are sort of, that's the result of step 1. I found the x values where the derivative is 0. Now the question is, are any of them maxes or mins? Or, you know, or maybe it's neither. But let's take a look now. So step 2, in this case though, I said to go a little bit further, I said use f prime prime to check concavity. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to write down f prime prime of x. I need a second derivative. My first derivative was this. So just look at this thing right here, and let's try to do the derivative of it. I'll leave it like this because it's maybe easier to work with than something like this. I could easily work with this as well, but I don't think it's as easy. Now I'd have to use a product rule, and so maybe I'll just leave it like this. So I want the derivative of this thing now because that's the derivative. The second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. In other words, I start with this now. Instead of before where I started with this original function and did the derivative of that to get this, now I'm going to start with this and take its derivative. That gives me the second derivative. So this 2 comes in front and makes it a 6 times x. And this minus 12, the x disappears and the 9 disappears. So that's nice. It's just this. Well, I set that. Uh, whoops, I don't have to set that equal to 0. Sorry. I'm now just going to check then what happens here. So at at x equals 1, what's the second derivative? So f prime primed of 1 would be, let's see, I just care if it's positive or negative. Put in a 1 here. 1 times 6 is 6. 6 minus 12 is at negative value. That means it's concave down. So I'll say that, so concave down. 
And if it's concave down, like that's what the shape really does, that means this x equals one, that means this must be a maximum. So therefore, x equals one is a max value. Whoops. That's nice to know. So x equals one, that's a max value. And we'll do it here at x equals three. Well, what's the second derivative at three? If I put in a three here, three times six is 18. 18 minus 12 is a positive. That means it's like this. So that means it's concave up. And if a graph goes concave up, that means then that x equals three is a minimum. Now these are local max and local mins. Well, let's see what the graph looks like. Maybe that'll be nice to look at. So let's uh, maybe check that. So now I'll get out my calculator to check my results. I'll just clear what I had before here. That's the last graph I've been looking at. But I don't care about that. I want the new one. So my graph goes like this. X to the power of three. I want that minus six X squared plus nine X plus three. And yep, and then I do graph. Here we go, I have some function that goes like this. So let's just see, is x, uh, let's see, my thing here I said, I said that x equals one was a maximum. Let's see if that's really the case. I'll do calc, I'll do value at x equals one. Let's see what I get here. And x equals one, y is seven, and look, that looks like a local maximum, so that's good. And x equals three should be a minimum. So if I just type in three here, It'll tell me at x equals three, y is gonna be some value. But what I care about is look at this, it corresponds to a minimum. Yep, it is. So see how powerful that is. We don't need a calculator to do it, although it's always nice to check if you're allowed to use a calculator. But this is how we can use calculus, and this time using the second derivative to just look at concavity, to see if it's concave down or concave up. And remember, if it's concave down at that point, then you know that this is a maximum, and if it's concave up, then this point right here is a minimum. So you can sort of see that from the shape here. So that's how I like to deal with these things, and I hope that helps to take a look at using a second derivative to help you to check for local max or min. You could also do that, or you could also use the first method that I showed you in the last video, where we're looking at the sec uh, first derivative equals zero still, but the second step was to do a sign diagram with the first derivative. You can do that, or your step two can be replaced by just looking at what's the second derivative. Is it positive or negative? And that can also tell you if it's a max or a min.